Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in. We have a late night edition of Catalyst Talks. Uh, we're going to get ready to do something unusual. I'm going to bring in live to uh, San Jose State University, their graduate degree program in Masters of Transportation Management and Leadership uh, at their School of Business. So uh, let me see if I can pull this in here. You're going to be watching me in real time. Here we go. I surely hope this works. Oh, got a password to join. Da, da, da. Password to join. And they do this, by the way, so that we don't get uh, hacked by the zoomies. Dun, dun, dun. Doesn't show a password, but I'm going to assume it's this one. Pump bomb. Mm -mm. <sighs> And you think I'm going to edit this out, but I'm not, because this makes it just as fun. Call Lynn Lear. Hello. Hey, Lynn, I'm looking for the password because it looked like it was one click, but it's asking me for a password. Uh, yeah, go right ahead. Ready to go. 402086. 402086. There it is. Boom. You're in. All right. All right. Look at everybody there. Okay. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Okay. All right, so we have our guest speaker here, and uh, hello, everybody. Happy to introduce him, he's a good friend of mine and a colleague. Uh, Joseph Kopscher has a pretty and pretty diverse career, and and, uh, and is associated with the transportation sector, as you saw from his LinkedIn profile. Uh, he's a graduate of the U.S. Military Academy. He also taught at West Point. Uh, we happen to teach there at the same time. Uh, he's had he's been deployed uh, and we actually were deployed at the same time um, he also ran for Congress and the uh, which district was a 21st Texas district, 21 Texas. Um, but more importantly for us is his uh, his work in the transportation sector and leading and, and uh, innovation um, and I asked him to come tonight to talk about both leadership, but also about the innovation aspects uh, as well. And he's got a lot to share with you. And we have uh, we have him for the next hour. So Joseph, welcome to our class, uh, MTM 217, Leadership Management and Transportation Organizations. Well, thanks for having me. I'm gonna take care of some admin here real quick and shut the door because our brand new puppy is on the loose. And so I'm gonna make sure that she doesn't get in. Uh, hey Piper, I've gone live, okay? All right. Uh, so anyway, we, you know, when Lynn sent me the information about this invitation, I jumped on it. Uh, whoop, hold on. How about now? Can you hear me now? There you are. There you go. I lost you in the canopy. Yeah, no, though, it's fine. I just wanted to make sure that I had my door shut and let my daughter know she's home from spring break that now is a seven long week spring break from college. Uh, she's at another U. She's at SMU. Uh, and uh, is a creative computing major, came home and has been here ever since. So anyway, it, it's a huge honor to be talking to you all because when Len and I were talking about what this class is trying to accomplish, what you're trying to do in your careers, uh, in many ways, um, first of all, y'all have been there, done that, most of you, in a sector that is near and dear to my heart. You know, what uh, you probably saw from my LinkedIn is, uh, I look like the greater part of my career was involved in the military, but really for the last 10 years, I've been heavily involved in the intersection of mobility, 
transportation and smart cities. Uh, and so, Lynn, am I um, driving the slides here? You have the right to share a screen. So okay, yeah. let me share the correct screen if I can. Do 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 do. Not that one. How about that one? We're going to share it. Uh, and what's interesting here is, and by the way, I do a live podcast. So you all are technically on my live podcast, except for when I share my screen, which is right now. So um, I'm not going to be too fancy because I want to make sure you can see everything. Can you see everything now, Lynn? Does it come up as Gray Line Group? Yep. Okay, good. So here's what I tell everybody. Uh, and whether you know my background or not, the bottom line is I'm always trying to fix problems. And when I say that, what I mean is if I think I have the capacity to either do it myself or bring in friends or colleagues or learn how to do it, I want to try to fix it. And 10 years ago, I realized that better mobility will lead to better upward mobility for all of society. And I know that sounds very cliche, uh, but a lot of you all are on the front lines doing this every day. Um, but what's interesting about it is that technology is changing faster than business models in the private sector. And as many of you all know that have work in the public sector, certainly faster than them. And for housekeeping purposes, Lynn, please interrupt me if somebody throws a hand up or they throw a, a question down in chat, because I'm going to be looking at the camera and not necessarily looking at you all. Is that OK? Got it. Good. Um, and here's the other kicker is that this idea of global connectivity magnifies how fast this is changing. And COVID, by the way, is just one more catalyst to speed up this whole process moving towards uh, this future that we're headed to. So just so you know who I am and how I see the world, uh, I may have built a company in transportation and sold it and have a lot of experience, but that doesn't define who I am. I was in the military, but that doesn't define who I am. The one common trait between the work I did there in the military both at the tactical, what we call the boots on the ground level, all the way up to the strategic, which is where you're looking at multi-billion dollar decisions and you're looking at it from the grand scheme of things to the work that I did in academia. You know, I taught, like Lynn said, alongside him, but I taught for five years, three at West Point, two years at the University of Texas. So I was boots on the ground in the classroom, seeing, seeing students like you every day but also involved as a department chair with meetings from a strategic standpoint about the future of education, how we think about the future of work. But then I was also in uh, the startup world. Some of you may know my work with Ride Scout. I did a lot of work out in the Bay Area uh, when we launched our company six, seven, eight years ago, whatever it's been now. Um, but most importantly, what I learned there was boots on the ground, how to take an idea, put it into action, and then work with business and the public sector to actually turn it into something real. And then after Mercedes hired or acquired my company, I was then at the strategic level of Mercedes looking with them globally about the future of mobility and transportation. And then the last little foray of my career was when I decided to try to re return to public service. I ran for Congress, Texas 21 here in, in, in Texas. And that was a great eye opener because it exposed me to, again, the tactical startup side of an idea, which is I want to run for Congress and serve all the way up to the strategic side where I'm looking at national politics. I was going to meetings in Washington, D.C. with senior government officials that you see on the news every night. And so in all four career spaces, I was going from boots on the ground where the rubber meets the road, working with customers every day. But I was also seeing it from the strategic side, which is a very different way to see things. Uh, because some people only exist in the tactical, some people only exist in the strategic, but I think the framework for tonight with your class, and again, I don't want to be the only one talking, I want to hear your questions, is that I've seen these problems from four different angles, both from bottoms up and top down, and I hope that adds something to the value of the discussion. But what drives me, though, the whole purpose are these three girls. This was a photo taken back in 2006, right before I went to Iraq the second time. It's one of my all-time favorite photos. Uh, and let's see, and these are the girls just a couple of years ago. So they're all grown up, but they helped me see the world through the lens of somebody other than myself. And they are the reason for what I do all the time. 
we cannot have this discussion talking about big data and transportation and the leadership required to create the strategy to move through this without making sure we appreciate how technology has changed over time. So this slide, uh, you know, goes everything from how things change dramatically with Pony Express, telegraph, telephone, internet, mobile internet. Each one of those were big giant step functions. But the difference though, is that today, the rate of change that's happening and all the new technologies and all the new conditions that are going to be impacting the world, not only that you're working in right now, but for some of you that might be promoted into new positions of leadership, you're going to be faced with things that maybe you haven't seen in a while or nobody's ever seen before. And then you layer into it the uncertainty of what COVID's doing to the future of work and the future of society all of it changing. And so you can see there on the right-hand side that so much has occurred in just even the last 10 years that it's hard to wrap our brain around it. But that is where you all come in from a leadership standpoint. You know, I throw this slide in here. You don't have to stare at the numbers or memorize them, but it just basically means that turnover has become the norm, that it's not uncommon for companies to be born, have a great career, and then fold or go bankrupt. What's different is that the rate of change is speeding up now. And you can see, you know, it used to be 14 and a half years. Uh, now it's down to just uh, eight and a half uh, in terms of the difference between companies that existed. And now 62% of Fortune 500 companies were replaced in the last 15, 20 years, as opposed to very few years ago. Uh, so your job, your job when you either return to where you are or with this degree and with this education that you're going to do is to try to figure out how do you identify and then manage this change. So, um, you know, in different sectors, in the, in, in the private sector, we would call it crisis management or um, product market fit, making sure that what we're doing is what the customer wants and doing surveys. You know, in the military, you know, the enemy always gets a vote. So in this particular case, I always encourage people to ask three questions. What happened? What are we going to know? What are we going to do about it? And who needs to know? And so in everything we talk about, and we'll get into the nitty gritty of what you all study in this course. But if you always look at it from a leadership standpoint of trying to translate those three questions, you're going to be better off. Um, you know, I, you all are in the business. I don't even have to tell you that U.S. infrastructure is in a hard way. This report came out a few years ago from the American Society of Engineers. We have to do something better about connecting where people live to where they work, to where they go to school, to the faces and places that they want to go to. And that's, you know, um, the hard part. Now, the good news is hard does not equal impossible. Uh, and what you all are learning right now are what I call catalysts. So this is a shameless promotion for my book uh, called Catalyst, Leadership and Strategy in a Changing World. And what my co-author and, co and business partner, Brett Boyd, uh, and I are focused on is what is happening out there? And we think it comes from these six areas. What's happening out there that is causing all these changes to have such an impact? We look at things like covid well, no kidding that the most number of people in cases are coming from densely populated areas. So that's an issue of demographics in terms of proximity in cities. But on the policy side, why is it that the United States, which represents about you know four or five percent of the world's population, three percent depending on how you measure it, somehow accounts for twenty-five percent of the world's death toll? So those two don't mix. I mean, everybody's impacted by cities and demographics, and yet we're impacted in a different way. So that's what we're going at. And I just give one example of solar power efficiency, and it's the same for transistors and microchips and everything that's out there, which is in terms of the gains that we're making in technology, they're starting to get exponential, which makes it even harder for your decision cycle. But here's the good news. There's a lot of things, though, that are getting cheaper. Think about autonomous vehicles, autonomous buses, and what it means if we could get the battery technology to a point where we're running on solar powered or carbon less or carbon free vehicles. And this particular slide just adds one more example. Um, I, this slide I had in there before COVID, but we don't even need to talk about it. Not only are jobs being destroyed by automation, but now they're being destroyed 
by COVID, but more importantly, here's what we got to think about in your class and your transportation and people going from where they live to where they work, which is, you know, part of your charge and your mission. What happens when the very nature of their job changes? Was that from you, Lynn? Was that somebody said something or is that a dog in the background? Uh, no. Somebody. Okay, I'll keep going then. So what all of you are going to face is that age old adage. Oh, let me see here. I'm going to check to make sure that this isn't you texting me, by the way, is it saying that you need something? Because I'm going to need you, Lynn, to just talk to me. <laughs> no, it's me. Okay, good. Um, so here's what you're going to face if you haven't already faced this in all of your uh, jobs and all of your company's organization is that person at the end of the table who, when it's time to think of some new ideas, it's time to think of new ways of doing business, they're going to raise their hand, they're going to act real smug, and they're going to say, young, you know, young man, young lady, whatever it is, I know you're new here, but this is the way we've always done it. And you're going to be fighting that. I fought it my entire 25, 30-year professional career because organizational agility and adaptability and flexibility is something that is absent from a lot of organizations and that causes them to be stuck in the past. Because at the end of the day, this woman, she does not care about your organization's inflexibility. She doesn't care about the processes inside the organizations that you either work in now or will work to work in the future. She just wants to know, can you provide me a seamless way to know the information, to know the means, to know the modes that I need to get to and from work because she does not want to be sitting there on this bus stop bench. She wants to get home to her kids or she wants to join her family or wherever she's going, she doesn't want to spend a lot of time here. So that's our responsibility. Think about how we use data and make it useful, which in this case turns it into information so that she knows more about it. Um, I'm not going to get into all this. This is Susan Shaheen's work down in Cal Berkeley. I'm sure you all are familiar with it. Uh, it gets into all the different old and traditional styles of transportation and then all the new modes that are coming in and where they overlap. This, by the way, is a shameless plug for Ride Scout, my old company. Uh, but it's important, I think, on, on this day, May 4th, and may the 4th be with you all, on May 4th, to not only show you Ride Scout and what we were building 10 years ago, eight, nine, 10 years ago, with this need for conveying information real time, multimodal about all the options around you. I mean, this is still important and valuable stuff. Move it, one of our competitors eight, 10 years ago, just sold their company finally to Intel. Today, the news was announced for a billion dollars. They have 800 million users, which, in the context of your course, think in terms of data. They have the data and the mobility data on 800 million people and Intel, for the purpose of their autonomous vehicle development, felt that that was worth a billion dollars, which you could kind of argue it was. But we're gonna talk hopefully in Q&A about why that's so important. So this is the challenge that everybody's got, how to move people, how to arrange the information, how to organize that data. But this kid here, just like that woman on the on the bus stop bench, he cannot wait for you. He cannot wait for your organization to fix itself. He is not going to wait for the new this or the new process for that or the new uh, way of reducing red tape because by evidence by this kid's shoes, he or she does not have the time to wait and they're going to get wherever they've got to go either with your help or not. And that is what I love trying to drive home to transportation professionals because we're not, and you've heard this, it's cliche, we're not in the business of moving vehicles. In fact, I would even argue we're not even really in the business of moving people. What we're in the business of is connecting people, connecting job opportunity, improving quality of life. We are in the business of people and connecting them with the places and faces of where they want to go. Uh, and by the way, as I said in the beginning, technology is not going to sit around and wait for y'all. It's not going to wait for me. It's not going to wait for anybody. Uh, there are amazing opportunities that are out there right now to say, well, wait, 
if we're doing this delivery, something autonomous, this autonomous drone by air, by ground, is our mission simply to move buses or trains or turn wheels or whatever it might be? Or can we use our available resources, our network to connect people again to the places and faces or the things, the products and services that they want? Uh, and then I love this picture. I love this picture because it is a kid like her, regardless of where she was born, regardless of the means in her life, she does not even get to vote literally or figuratively about how all of your decisions, past, present, and hopefully your future decisions, impact her. Um, you know, there there is a food scarcity in this country that is incredible. There was a great study put out years ago, three, four, five years ago out of Duke that found out that we as a medical industry, just from healthcare alone, spend sometimes as much as 10, 20, even $30,000 on a single hospital visit for a little girl her age when she becomes food insecure. And what that basically means is she either doesn't have the calories or the nutrition. And I'm talking about the United States, the, the calories or the nutrition to keep her healthy. So then her parents take her to the emergency room. That expensive emergency room visit ends up becoming a doctor's appointment in the hospital. And oftentimes she'll be kept for two or three days. Those bills mount up tens of thousands of dollars. And worse, from a transportation mobility perspective, she'll have a follow-up appointment. But it might be that her parents do not have access, access being the key word, to reliable mobility to get her back, meaning that she likely might get sick again and right back in the hospital, either because she can't get access to the food, calories, or nutrition she needs, or to return to the medical appointments that she needs. So if you look at mobility from a much larger lens, aka much larger budget, than just the cost of transportation, movement of people, goods, or services alone, and we start as a society to look at it from a holistic, fully burdened cost is the word that I use or the phrase I use. If you look at it from a fully burdened cost standpoint, well, now you have a real opportunity to say, wait, if it would have cost $30,000 to hospitalize one kid over a three-day period for food insecurity, well, what if we had just partnered with the hospital for pennies on the dollar dare I even say a couple hundred dollars to dispatch a vehicle, a type or a service, public or private, out to her rural home, pick her and her parents up, deliver her back to her follow-up appointment. And now we've combined healthcare with mobility. We've increased her quality of life. We've made her life healthier and we've reduced the overall cost of transportation and burden on the taxpayer. Those are the kind of perspective, I just tweeted about it today and blogged about it. In fact, that's the kind of perspective I encourage everyone, regardless of sector, to look at how you're using data, how you're looking at costs, how you're getting it all wrapped in together. So as we get near the end, change creates opportunity and risk at the same time. Many of you are either in a public organization or you're going to a public organization, hopefully one day, moving into a leadership position, public sector or private, where you're going to have the opportunity to decide. Taking this risk of some new program, some new pilot, some new opportunity is worth it. And I'm willing to stake my reputation because sometimes we might fail, but that failure is a learning opportunity. All too often, we meet organizations that are too scared to take a risk, and therefore, they end up listening to that voice at the end of the table that says, this is the way we've always done it here. Okay, I, I just want to take a couple minutes because uh, this is all about leadership as well. It's not just about how we use data and think about mobility, but it's about the leadership needed to be able to take us to that next level. And I say this everywhere I go, people will be what they can see. And each of you, with what you're learning here in, in class, what you're learning from your peers in your other classes, 
you have the opportunity to be the change that you want to see. So if you want to see organizations take risks and do things more dynamic, you have to lead that. You have to provide those ideas. You have to have the courage to push those ideas. People will be what they can see. And you will be pleasantly surprised long term that the more you try to be the change you want to see, that people will follow. So um, I'm going to make these slides available uh, for your class and you can take a look at them later. But, you know, it all boils down to these simple points. People will be what they can see. Use all of your talents to your potential. Everybody's got different talents. Mine is not in singing. Uh, if it was, I'd be in the back of a Volkswagen bug somewhere trying to get a gig somewhere. Uh, but where I do have the ability is to stitch together different areas to see where solutions can come from, find balance in all things. Uh, you know, COVID is a good chance to remind us that when we do anything to any extreme, like stay at home for six, eight weeks, it's not entirely the best way to do it. So introverts, if you're out there, go rescue your extroverts. Uh, manage expectations. You are going to fail. You are going to make mistakes. You will be told no. Uh, and I think it's important just to kind of figure that out. And then, uh, you know, my three simple concepts for life, which I'll get to in just a second. So I'm, I'm not going to go too deep into these. I just want to impress on the fact that no matter what you study, no matter what data you come up with, no matter what information you want to convey, if you are not role modeling what you want to see done, people ain't going to follow you. Uh, there's a quote that I love, and I'll probably mess it up, even though I love it, which is people do not care what you know until they know that you care. And, and that's a really easy way to sum up this point uh, because, you know, if you dem if you demonstrate the mentorship and seek out, and I bet you some of you are in this program today because you had a boss somewhere along the way that said, you need to be in this program. And that's the mentorship, uh, knowing that it's a two-way street that I think you could benefit from. You know, using all your talents uh, I don't want to go too deep into this, but I'm a big believer in lifelong learning. That's why you know we're recording this because I want to share it with others. Len and I invited some of our friends from West Point that we taught together to join us for this. Maybe they want to learn something more about mobility, transportation, uh, finding balance in all things. If you burn yourself out as a leader, you're going to be good to nobody in it. Uh, in terms of managing expectations, mistakes are going to happen. I hope you all are the leadership necessary in your organizations. And here are my three thoughts for simple life. I've raised my daughters with this saying. I share it with everybody, which is just try to be happy, try to do the right thing, and try to have a good thing to say, especially those of you who continue to stay in the mobility and transportation industry. If I've learned one thing, it is a very small community. Your reputation will precede you. Uh, I've seen people have amazing opportunities for promotion and advancement because they take care of people. They look down as opposed to look up. And they look down and try to take care of their team, uh, you know, and have a good thing to say because, shoot, all of this is hard and anybody can complain, but it's people that try to work together that matter. Uh, so anyway, that's me. That's what I do. Uh, you know, I had the opportunity to come and speak last semester with uh, Lynn and got to share my book with a lot of folks. That's a shameless plug. Go take a look at it. You know, follow me on LinkedIn. Follow me on Twitter. I'd love to keep the conversation going. So, okay. I'm going to turn off SlideShare boop, and go back to everybody here. Can you still see me, Lynn? Yes. Excellent. Can. Okay. Now I am, let's see, I'm here for all your questions. Let's take this in any way. I mean, the backgrounds that you all have are very diverse, a lot of different experience levels, um, I'm happy to go into more depth about big data and the price of data and the role of government and the role of your own data. I'm happy to talk about the journey that I had with Ride Scout and building this company, mobility and transportation that uh, Mercedes later acquired. I'm happy to talk about Department of Transportation. I'm happy just to talk. <laughs> we have a hand. Okay, what do you got? Nana, go ahead. This is Nana. I work for AC Transit. Uh, hi, I'm the Assistant Transportation Superintendent there. Um, you talked about taking chances and leading the way, showing them that you care. Um, I didn't hear about cost involved in that part, um, and which is what I'm kind of curious about. The reason I'm asking this is that our company, AC Transit, um, just recently installed computer aided dispatch yep. in all our buses, um, CAD ADL. And then I got a call from 
a cloud-based um, client, uh, TripShot, they call it, they call them. And they talked about, oh, we missed the opportunity to kind of sell our product to you guys. And it will be awesome. It's Everything is managed in the cloud. You wouldn't have to have OCC. You know, we manage your videos. You manage all these things. And that kind of clicked my mind. I said, geez, how do I go about even introducing something like this to anybody and who would that person be and, and the cost involved and all of that. Because we're still kind of working out the kinks in the CAD ADL and we haven't even completed it yet. Then all of a sudden we have to scrap it and move on to the next one. So what, what's what's your pick on the cost and all that? All that? Well, so that's, so that's one of the biggest lessons learned I have with that graph, if you remember from the beginning about step functions. You know, when we went from Pony Express to the Telegraph to the telephone, you know, it was okay for an organization to go out and buy a new technology or new computer system because they were fairly confident, even as recent as the 70s and 80s, that that technology was going to be around for 20 years. But you you have to, first of all, change the mindset to realize that every platform you use from what you just described about bus transit dispatch all the way to human resources, how you manage and pay and schedule your employees, your operators, your teams, you have to move, in my recommendation, all of those processes as quickly as possible to web-enabled, cloud-enabled software systems that talk well to other systems. If you have a vendor come in and tell you, and I'm not going to name names because there are some that are still like this, that say, well, you can use our stuff, but we're the sole vendor. We have no APIs, which is basically a portal that allows you to share the information with other groups. If they say that they're going to lock all that data up and it's only theirs and only, you know, we're sharing it together and you can't use it for other purposes, not just run away, but go so far from them that you never have to talk to them again because you're likely to put yourself at the risk that you sort of describe with your point there, which is, hey, we, we just bought something, but now we have another thing that came along. Uh, every, every municipality, assuming we're talking government here, AC Transit, uh, will have different levels of authority of what their allowable spending limits are. Uh, there might be things that certain managers at certain levels can do with a credit card. There are certain levels of spending that are authorized without having to go to the board. There are certain levels of spending that are authorized to go to without having to go back to the taxpayer. What I encourage all of you all to do is to seek out working with these companies that are coming to you with all and full disclosure. I was one of those companies coming to public transportation divisions. Find the most efficient system for as little contractual or long term engagement as you can so that as new technologies come, you can open them up. So say somebody comes to you and says, we have a whole new way for, well, let me give you a real world example that's coming. Somebody is likely going to propose a contactless tracing technology tool that will allow your operators on your vehicles to know that the person entering their vehicle has either been tested or has antibodies or is safe. And if you get a vendor that comes to you that says, we have this tool, but it's proprietary to us. We don't share our data and you can't use it on multiple databases. Multiple, You just need to block them as soon as you can because you need to be able to share data, share function, share service. Did, did I answer your question? I feel like I'm going too deep in the hole because you I'm asked happy, a very good I'm question. Happy. You, I was able to probe you to say more, so that's good. You did. Okay. <laughs> We've got several hands up. Uh, let me go in order that I see them. A couple of people put their hands back down, but uh, Kimia, you're next. Okay. Hi, um, my name is Kimia. I work for the Freight Railroad in the Port of LA and Long Beach. Um, my question is, as you develop your organization and it scales in size, what are the recommendations that you have um, to maintain the culture um, among your employees? I've noticed that um, companies are really wonderful as startups. You have a very strong cohesive team. But unfortunately, as you scale, things become more process oriented. And so change becomes less likely, et cetera. So I'm just going to turn it over to you and ask you how you would handle a situation like that. Well, it's a great question. And first of all, so I want to give you props. Is that the Black Knights logo from the Las Vegas hockey team? 
<laughs> it's the golden uh it's the golden nuggets from las vegas <laughs> yes yeah but that's the new hockey is it a hockey team yes hockey team. okay well, the owner is a West Point alum who tried to use all the West Point uh, logo stuff. And then West Point came along and brought in all their patent fringes stuff, oh. copyrights. But anyway, but I recognize it. But your question is awesome. Uh, so let me give you two or three different lenses to look at. So let's look at it just from a standpoint of large organizations. I've said this for years. I say this everywhere I go. Rules, not laws but rules, processes, what you were describing, are there for 95% of the people, 95% of the time. Because otherwise, if a large organization acted like a startup, i.e. come and go as you wish and please and do, we would never be, get, be able to get anything done because you couldn't predict anything. So rules are for 95% of the people, 95% of the time. Your responsibility as a leader, as you're growing your organization and you're scaling in scope and authority, is to think thoughtfully about which rule applies in which situation. Or said in a better way, when you can break your own rules in order to accomplish your mission. There is a fabulous Planet Money episode that just came out. I was listening to it in the last 24 hours about the assistant state comptroller from the state of Illinois who hand delivered, drove in her car, a three and a half million dollar check from the state of Illinois, drove it 120 miles to meet a vendor halfway to get that money deposited so they could buy the protection equipment that they needed from a manufacturer in China to have it in the bank before they woke up the next morning. There ain't no rule anywhere in the state of Illinois that would have allowed that to happen under normal conditions. So again, one person outside that 95%, one time outside the 95% of normal, made a call as a leader. Now, if she had gotten in trouble, she would have been ready to live with those consequences. But hopefully, to answer your question, you create a learning organization that says, hey, we're going to make mistakes. And as long as you, the person on the ground, the person making the call, makes the right call, or let me rephrase it, makes the call based on the right information that you had at the time, but we're not going to be mad at you. We're going to support you. And if other people in the company see you fail, but then you get up and your boss, or in your case, if you're the boss, if you have a teammate fall and you brush him or her off and say, okay, it didn't go right. It didn't go as we had planned. What do we learn from it? What can we apply in the future? When everybody sees that you've created a culture of opportunity to risk, I don't care if your company is 10 people, 100 people, or your entire you know, rail organization has 10,000 employees, that news that you have their back is going to spread faster than the fact that they got bad coffee in the break room. Um, and so, to, to wrap it all up about how you create culture or maintain it as you grow, there's no easy answer. Uh, it, I believe it's all a part of continuing education and tradition and norms. Um, you know, there's a whole reason why the military had to create a special forces. We can't have everybody in the rank and file of the military do all the things that the special forces does. Hence the term special forces. And so inside your organization, as you get bigger, as you all scale, you might have to create your own version of special forces that follow 95% of the rules 95% of the time. But when you need them to do something creative or unusual, they can break out. And, and last thing I'll say, just because you're right there in the valley, um, the whole reason why Palo Alto, not the only, one of the biggest reasons why Palo Alto became uh, a world landmark that it is, is Xerox which was the biggest name in printing and paper supplies for the first 50, 60 years of this innovation in the office space, said, we need to do something different. But every time we send a research team down into the basement to build something, they're impacted by the people upstairs. So they sent them from New York all the way out to your neck of the woods to create the Palo Alto Research Center to physically get them away from the flagpole to your point, to get them away from those in transit people who didn't want to change, who didn't want to do things differently. 
And luckily, because of that, we have the Silicon Valley we know today. Now, Silicon Valley today can make some improvements on the stuff that they're doing because they've got some people that have been doing it for too long and they need to innovate. So anyway, hope that answers your question. That's a good, that was a good response, I think. Uh, we've got we've got some more hands up. Uh, Al Jaffrey, you're next. All right, thank you. I have two questions. Like one of them is a little bit uh, for government employees, for example. Yeah. Every four years or so, we get a new, uh, like we elect a new governor or every eight years, and they have different ideas. Sometimes they're Republicans, and, and basically they, Sometimes they think smaller government, some ones bigger government. And if you're in upper management, how do you deal with this philosophy change? And the second question, how would uh, a company uh, like uh, gather information as big data and sell it for a lot of money? And how is the owner uses it for the yeah. benefit? Well, so let me take your first question first, which is how as a senior government official, you navigate the fact that changing uh, elected officials have perhaps different views of how things work. Well, the first thing I would tell you is, and I encourage this for all of my friends that are uh, career civil servants at the city, state, and federal level, which is as long as you are always looking out for the best interests of the community, as long as you are always trying to do right by the data and the information, the facts that you have, you will, regardless of leadership, be able to be seen as a subject matter expert. That means that whether it's Democrat or Republican that comes into office, your reputation will precede you and they will start to pull you in the, for decision making. The worst thing that you could do in those senior leadership positions is start to bend in the direction of whatever the political wind is that is blowing because if you're seen as stepping over the line of civil service and getting on the political, well, then it doesn't matter how smart you are. As soon as the next person comes in, if they're of the opposite party, you might be gone in all those years of experience. And by the way, you know, we couldn't have a better role model, a better example of that today than Dr. Fauci. You know, in the COVID world of his ep epidemiologist, this guy has been at the front line since HIV, 40, 50 years uh, in government service. What a breath of fresh air. So I don't know if that speaks to the point of your question, but that is the direction I would take my answer, which is to be seen as a subject matter expert, a career civil servant that is doing it for the right reasons. And over time, the right elected officials will, will um, appreciate that. Now, you mentioned the word budget, so I'll just add one more thing to that answer, which is convert everything that you do from a mobility or transportation budget into numbers beyond just the standard movement of wheels, turning, spinning, tracks, vehicles, whatever. Go back to my analogy about food insecurity from that Duke example. Go find that paper. Go find that paper and try to translate to elected officials that you're trying to say, look, I know we provide rail or bus service in this community, but when you look at the map, when you look at the headways, when you look at the frequency, we're not providing access. But if you let me do a pilot where I could work with private or public entities to do non-traditional modes of transportation, to go maybe on demand or on a semi-flexible schedule by distance, by time, by schedule, and go get those people and bring them to where they need to be. Well, now you've translated that into something beyond budget. Now you're talking about quality of life in other areas. So that's that's the first part. Um, your second part, again, remind me because I got so excited about your first question and I forgot your second. Well, thank you. I, I really appreciate what you. My second question is about the big data. Like, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Probably from phones and different things, and then you were able to package it and sell it. It's probably a tremendous. And how does it provide value for the person that buys? Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, let's think about this. What color tennis shoe I like to buy, or what length of my sock? in and of itself, by itself, is a very insignificant piece of data and is basically worthless to anybody outside of a shoemaker or a sock maker by itself. But when you start to aggregate all that, 
it becomes valuable enough that somebody is going to provide a free search engine for me, or they're going to provide free email for me, or free office services like Google does. Uh, so what you have to think about is when we built the internet, uh, and, there, and there's a great podcast called A16Z, A16Z, and you can hear about the early days of the internet and how they designed it. They never, well, they some people did consider the role that your data and your information would be. They were going to try to make a free internet, meaning that the only way people were going to make money as it evolved ended up becoming ads. And that's what we have today. And therefore, if ads drive the cost of the infrastructure of the internet, then private companies have got to put your eyeballs in front of their ads. And then when you click on them, and by the way, I believe the percentage is 0.001% of all people actually read the terms and conditions of services about what it is that they're just freely giving up in terms of their data. When you give up that freedom, you give up your data, and then those people end up selling it. So in full disclosure, my company, Grayline, uh, is actually working with the Mineta Institute looking at cybersecurity and an upcoming survey that we've been working on, on the value and the interconnectivity between the importance of protecting that mobility data that transit agencies have with the overall mission we have to provide mobility and do it as a service, learn from the data and yet protect consumers' data. Uh, I'm working right now, my company works with uh, CODA, the Central Ohio Transit Authority, and we're trying to tell them like we tell everybody, hey, cities, municipalities, most, oh no, not Siri, my phone just turned on. Um, most every municipality in the country that's your data, but you're just either storing it in a non-cloud-based, non-accessible location that nobody can get to or learn from, or maybe you are thinking ahead. I, I shameless plug for my colleague from Ride Scout, Regina, who created a company called Populous that's working very closely with mobility and transit providers to say, let's let's get all the data you have, let's return the value to the to the user, the, the citizen, and then, oh, by the way, along the way, be a better partner with private sector companies and let's share some of this data. Uh, you know, move will move it, selling today for a billion dollars. If they have 800 million users, you can figure that somebody at Intel estimated the lifetime value of each one of those customers to be a little bit more than a dollar. It doesn't sound like a lot but when you aggregate that across a whole lot of people over a whole lot of time. That's a lot of value. But I'm a huge proponent to remind cities and many of you all will work in public transit agencies. That's your data. Work with the private sector who might be a little ahead of you on processing that data. But that's still your data. Don't give it up. Good response. Uh, ben, you've got a question. Yeah, so a follow-up question to that. Uh, I think you mentioned protecting data, and since we are in, a, uh, in the years where privacy matters are being con a concern to the general public, public, and private sectors being the ones driving the ownership of data of public infrastructures or goods, how does protecting that data matter, and how can we do it? And by providing my data, should I? And I'm not a proponent of uh, uh, privacy rights, like the data rights. But since, as an uh, you said, as an aggregate, a company would make fortune out of data. Shouldn't the data that are being given freely be compensated in some way or form? Well, in some ways, you are you are getting something for your data. So, I mean, I'm a big proponent. I happen to use a lot of Google products. Uh, so I got Google Gmail, I got Google Office, I get Google Hangout. And on most of the services, I don't pay a thing directly, but I pay indirectly by giving Google all that information. However, you mentioned protection of that data, and that's critical. Um, 
you know, I, I, I come from a philosophy that we have two choices writ large. We have two choices with how we can look at protecting data. Do we do it like a tortoise? which means we put a shell around it and say, okay, this is our data and we're going to protect it. Nobody else is going to get to it. Here, let me turn my light down. It's the, the sun's going down here in Texas and stuff. No, oh, down. There. Oh, down. Okay. Um, you know, do we put a shell around it and protect that data and make sure that nobody steals it? Well, the problem with that is then nobody can use it. So if you're protecting your data so hard that nobody can use it, well, then it's hard for researchers. It's hard for city officials. It's hard. So the opposite extreme of protecting it with a shell around it, like a turtle would do, to think of using or protecting data like a rabbit might. And what I mean by that is just to be faster than the bad guy. So you get your data, and pew, we come over here, and pew, we come over here, pew, I'm just faster with my data. So great. You may break in and get some of my personally identifiable information, but when you try to take that PII and go over and create a new account for me, there's going to be new biometric markers in the new form of new whatever we're building that you can't get at. So great. I'll tell you my social security number. I won't really hear today, but I'm happy to tell you my social security number. But unless you have this thumbprint or you have these eyeballs, you're not getting in. So, Everybody on this call has to be thinking about privacy. You all have to be thinking about cybersecurity. Like I said, we're working with the with your institute right there in your backyard with Mineta to figure out how to protect that data. And this, the bad news is most government entities are dealing with computer systems that are so old. How old are they? They are so old that quite literally the 1970s called and wants all of their cobalt back. I mean, th look it up, Google it. There is an organization, remember the movie Space Cowboys, where we were worried about, you know, the Soviets or whatever, and they had something up there, we had to send astronauts up to disarm a satellite or a missile or something, I forget, but they call them the Space Cowboys because in the early 2000s, late 90s, nobody left in NASA knew how to use the equipment from the 60s. So an older Clint Eastwood and an older whomever, they were the actors, the heroes in this movie. Well, the same thing's happening right now with our major government computer systems because they were written in cobalt. I mean, I learned basic in the 80s. Cobalt was before me, and there's very few people that know how to use them. Um, I don't know why I went on that tangent other than to say privacy of your data is important. Cybersecurity is huge. We need to think of it as something valuable, but I argue toward thinking of the protection of it in terms of a rabbit staying ahead of the bad guys, because if we think of it in terms of a turtle, sure, we might keep it safe, but then nobody gets to use it. Nobody gets to learn from it. So I don't know if that answered your question, but I sure had fun trying to answer it. <laughs> All right. We've got Greg and then Alex next. So Greg, go ahead. Um, so one thing I want to, I'm actually going along with what everyone else is doing is about privacy. I don't know if it's a California thing or what, but uh, you said that privacy is important, but I didn't hear it during your original presentation and actually our assigned reading today's the word privacy is not mentioned once in any of the readings. So I'm just curious, um, how is it a good sign of leadership or why is it that privacy seems to be a non-existent discussion and I've worked uh, with transportation and big data system for four years and even the smartest people privacy is just like I don't know it seems like a four-letter word for some people I'm just curious why is that? Well let me tell a, a humorous historical anecdote from popular culture and then I'll get to the seriousness of your question because I, I don't mean to uh, not cover it in enough detail so let me go back to it uh, so in the movie from the 1970s, Steve Martin, uh, if, uh, one of his first movies was a movie called The Jerk. And in that movie, he gets a job as a gas station attendant. And he was so thrilled when he finally had his name in the white pages of the phone book. However, in that same movie, another character, a bad guy who was a you know random uh, uh, shooter, found his name by complete randomness and then went and stalked him out and was shooting at him because he found his name in there. Now, uh, 
I bring that up to say that privacy has always been an issue. We are always living in that teeter-totter of the difference between maximum civil liberties, which means I can go and do everywhere that I want to be and do at full civil liberties, with the need for protecting my own privacy. It is the same problem that we've had in communities and subdivisions around fences, which is I want to be able to build a fence tall enough for all of my privacy. And yet if I build it too high, then it becomes a civil liberties infraction for my neighbors who want to be able to have a view of the sunset. We will never get the right balance. All we can ever do is try to strive towards getting the closest balance based on technology and the need. And um, so let me answer your immediate question, then I want to give you a, a current example problem. So if we as individuals want to continue to have near free or low cost, almost everything that we pretty much have to do today, and again, go and Google how many people actually read the privacy terms and use on a new app that they download. If we're going to maintain that laissez-faire kind of attitude, sadly, if we don't want to pay for it, if we don't want to read the fine print, we're going to unfortunately be victim to people who take advantage of us in that area. I think the better balance, actually, I think California and Europe are kind of going in the right direction, which is, hey, it's you, the people, it's your data. You should be able to take it back with a caveat. If you get a whole bunch of free stuff from me and all I'm asking for is some of your data, that's that trade-off that we've got to figure out what we can get. Now, let me move to the immediate today. For us to return to work successfully, we have to have testing to know who might have COVID. We need to know who's been tested for COVID. But the most important piece is then we have to be able to translate that information to whom it matters. We have to translate it to our employer. We have to translate it to our public transit system or ecosystem of which we want to travel upon. Um, so I, you know, I didn't mean to dismiss it by not talking about it enough in the beginning, but it is a constant trade-off between civil liberties and privacy. And it is a constant trade-off between maintaining your privacy and what people are willing to pay to keep it. And I don't mean pay just in terms of money, but pay in terms of hassle. I mean, I'm not going to do a show of hands, but how many of you all have your passwords written on a scrap of paper taped to your monitor? And how many of you all have very sophisticated password remember, you know, memory systems and software systems on your computer? It, it's just a trade-off between the two. Did I even come close to addressing the seriousness of your issue? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but the bottom line is, I'm not pretending to have the answer. I just want to make sure you're asking all the right questions as you think about it in the context of what you're doing and in your current and future work. So we're coming to a close on the hour. Okay. Um, we've got two more hands that are up. Uh, I'll, let, I'll let Alex ask this question and let you answer it. Um, and at the class, I don't know, you said that you had more time or you don't have more time. I've got a couple of minutes, but I'm thrilled beyond belief. Tonight, uh, I am on a new episode, a PBS documentary called Power Trip, uh, the story of energy. And tonight's uh, topic is transportation. And I'm one of the people that they interviewed. So as soon as I'm done here, I'm going to run downstairs and grab a beer, sit there and watch PBS tonight and watch myself on television for a few minutes. Awesome. So we're going to just stick it with one last oh, question. Oh, we'll do two. I'll just make it speed round if there's still two hands up. Okay. Well, Alex, go ahead. Ask your question. Uh, thank you. So uh, my name is Alex. Uh, I work in public relations for a uh, commuter railroad uh, called Caltrain in the Bay Area. Heard so, of it? Um, my, sorry? I said I've heard of it. Go on. Oh, okay, cool. Um, so my question to you is having um, uh, 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 done sort of startup work and, and understanding the public reputation um, that comes with trying to build up your own uh, uh, brand and, and product and recognition, and then shifting over into a political campaign, which has a lot of crossover, but um, some different distinctions with uh, the kind of trying to build. Um, I was wondering if you had any insight into shifting from you know uh, corporate public relations into political public relations. Um, yeah. Because that carries over a lot into what transit agencies do, both on the political side and the 
um, public perception side. Yeah, wow. So I'm going to try to slice that from three different angles. I'll take it from my own personal angle. So here's just something interesting to think about. I was or have been out on the internet in various capacities from social media profiles, whatnot, blogging. I'll say I really kind of got into blogging somewhere around 2011, 2012. Since then, for the last eight years, I've, you know, put how much content out there, I don't know. However, Google and the Google algorithm, if you go to it right now on the side screen and type in Joseph Kopser, their little bio description of me on the side is still going to say, after 10 years of content, it's still going to say politician because in 18 months, so much media and earned media covered our race because it was a pretty popular race here in Texas that the Google al algorithm just thinks I'm a damn politician, even though ironically, I didn't even win the general election. I won the primary, but I didn't win the general. Uh, and yet Google forever, or at least for a while, thinks I'm a politician. And I say that to say that there is a great website that I would encourage you all to just keep in the back of your mind from time to time. It's called Word Art wordart.com and it's really easy to figure out you go to wordart.com and you can drop anything you want into it like your own personal website or maybe your blog or maybe a blog that you're writing or you have been writing but drop word art into that and then that will give you a sense of what the google machine what it thinks you are or what it thinks who you are, meaning that it's a count of all of the words that are associated with you. So for so long, because I was a political candidate running for office, or I should say not so long, so many articles were written, the Google machine thinks I'm still a politician. Drives me crazy. But the same thing applies for people when they are looking at your transit agency, your government agency, and or your press releases, and or your blogs, or you as an individual. So I'll wrap up your point, which is to say, and I'm not saying this is you, but I, I do know people who have gone in and out of private sector, in and out of public company or public organizations who forget that every word they've ever written, unless they pull it back and that's some of the new legislation, the words that they wrote are still out there on the interwebs. And you got to know that anybody can look at it. They're not supposed to. Employers are not supposed to comb the internet looking for what you've been writing, but it's out there. The rule that I always use is never write anything publicly that you wouldn't be proud to have on the front page of the New York Times or the LA Times, or in this case, you know, Len and I are recording this for your fellow students and for my uh, future use, because I'm not going to say anything I wouldn't say publicly. So I hope that answers your question super quick. What's the last one, Len? Uh, we got one more from, um, you're the last one, Mike. Yes, I just want to follow up that, uh, Mr. Joseph, the one you brought it up about the government, uh, the, the data uh, storage with the program, you know, COBOL. You know, I work for the California Department of Transportation, and in my background, I spent uh, at least uh, 10 to 15 years of the travel focus model that I used to build a, the trip generation that, you know, the, uh, the, the big data driven and and the problem with the government, I've been involved with the Federal Highway Administration FHWA for these data-driven committee with the uh, California Sacramento headquarters. The problem, we brought it up, we had a task, uh, a tech meeting at that, the upper management does not understand we need to update this machine and the language. And when we ask for millions of millions, in, even though California, we need about, in, uh, even though Caltrans, Department of Transportation in California, we need about more than 200 million. The management uh, doesn't want to write a check for these computer yeah. software. But yeah. they don't mind writing to build a real construction because they see that yep. because it's a public perspective, you know, they see that we build the bridges, we build the highway. But the the uh, the, the, the politician and upper management don't want to write a check for the, the replacing the computer software because <clears throat> they don't see it. Yeah, well, you know, I don't have a good answer for that, although my own personal story and journey is that's that's the whole reason why I wanted to leave the, pub, the private sector and return to the public sector as an aerospace engineer, as a tech guy, is we don't have enough representation at uh, all levels of government in those serious hard sciences or hard degrees. I think somebody measured it in our Congress. We have six people 
uh, that are among what we would call a hard science or a hard, you know, technical degree. So in the meantime, then you have two choices. Either A, continue to chip away around the edges to be able to figure out how you make incremental change, or you seize the opportunity with outside factors and outside influence. You know, Rahm Emanuel is famously quoted with, you know, don't let a good crisis go to waste. What he actually said was when something is this disruptive, there are opportunities to do things we could normally never, ever do. And that's when you jump in. So a great example of that was healthcare.gov. If you remember in November of 2013, when healthcare.gov was released, it was an $800 million project that took a year or two to build because they had like 30 or 40 contractors and subcontractors. They were doing it the old way. And as you recall, or some of you may recall, it crashed from day one, hour one, it crashed. So, you know, the incremental ways or to seize on the opportunities with COVID or whatever it might be to go back into your agencies to really make that point that, you know, I don't mean to be harsh, but, you know, these cobalt cowboys, just like we have the space cowboys, these cobalt cowboys, they're literally a dying breed. Uh, and I don't mean to be harsh, but there will someday be a day when nobody even has firsthand knowledge of some of these languages. And that's an opportunity. So I don't have a good answer for you other than to say, been there, done that, trying to make the change myself. And I wish you the best of luck. And it's actually a good place to end. So let me just reinforce, you have access to my LinkedIn at Joseph Kopser. You can go to my website, josephkopser.com. As you can tell by the fact that I barely took a breath in an hour, these are the conversations I love to have. And more importantly, the Q&A is my favorite point because I care more about what you all are interested in than my own personal experiences. And I look forward to being able to stay in touch and yeah, shamelessly promote my book if you want to go and find it. But you know, it's just on amazon.com as an ebook, you know, you can find it. Well, Joseph, I, I can't say thank you enough for uh, giving us an hour of your time. Uh, I know you're extremely busy and I really appreciate that. Everyone give them a round of applause and, and some appreciation greatly. Thanks everybody. Thank you. So good luck on the, Send me the send me a text of where you're being out so I can tell Annette to, to record it for you. Yeah, see. yeah, yeah. It's on your local PBS station and or PBS the app if you have it on your Apple TV or other device, or if you're Amazon Prime, you can buy episode number three. I think I'm tonight, episode three, uh transportation. And I'm also in another episode too, but yeah, just check out the whole thing. It's great. It's great. Okay. <laughs> I'll send you a text. Y'all take so care. You have a good night. See you later. Very class. We're going to take. Okay. So we are back to the end of this Catalyst Talks Live. This was one hour. What is it? One hour and almost 10 minutes. Uh, this is the stuff that I love to do. I mean, the fact that we were able to talk about transportation, not just from a transportation standpoint, but from a technology standpoint, from a leadership standpoint, from a change management standpoint, going all the way through. These, these ideas are tough. These are the issues we have to be thinking about. Uh, and as you could tell from how much fun I had, I love thinking about it. So if you want to invite me to join you on your next opportunity, invite me in to help with your organization, do whatever you uh, think might make sense. You can find me at josephcopser.com or you can find me on LinkedIn. So look forward to talking to y'all. Take care. Bye.